Um, but it also means that low skilled labor in your own country um, will find itself in less demand and will have to find you know, the people who might work in a textile factory in North Carolina that gets closed um, may not be able to find another textile factory to work in. They may have to, to find new jobs, find new uh, ways to make a living. And that brings structural change. Um, and so then the challenge for those countries is to figure out how to facilitate that, how to help workers who no longer, whose, whose jobs are no longer there to, to acquire new skills and to, and to find new lines of work. Through the late 1990s, and particularly um, you know, the period, say, from the Asian financial crisis um, into the, the mid-2000s, um, it was possible to look at the United States economy as, as very much an engine of the global economy because it had, very, it had a very open market. Um, all these, so many countries that were looking to export their way to economic development, um, you know, found a market, many of them found a market in the United States, and the U.S. was growing uh, faster than, on average, than most other developed countries. Um, it was displaying a, an ability to adjust to structural changes in a way that other developed countries were having trouble doing. Um, Japan was, uh, was in the aftermath of um, of the end of its bubble economy, uh, European countries were, were dealing with, with you know, rigid labor markets and having trouble responding to the structural changes that globalization brought to them. Um, along with that, the United States had had its issues then and still does, um, uh, a pretty big trade deficit, uh, a rising fiscal deficit, rising national debt. Um, things that you can't sustain forever. <clears throat> Along with all of that, what you saw was the United States and its partners in trade, in finance, investment, uh, including Japan, becoming more and more connected to each other, more and more reliant on each other. Um, I, I can't think of a better example of how interconnected we've become than to think that when the earthquake in Tohoku shut down uh, plants that were producing auto parts, you had auto assembly factories in places like Tennessee in the Midwestern United States that had to shut down because they couldn't get the parts they needed from the producers in Tohoku. Um, I'd say probably most people in Tennessee couldn't tell you where Tohoku is, and most people in Tohoku, I wonder if they would know where Tennessee is, and yet they have this kind of a connection as a result of, of globalization. So let's look a little more closely at, at the U.S. economy. I've, I've talked a little bit about um, trade and finance, I want to talk a little more about um, innovation in the U.S. economy and, and um, how the U.S. is, why, how the U.S. got into a, into a position of being able to um, deal with globalization so well compared with so many other countries. Um, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, the, the nature of its market system, the way the U.S. system fosters innovation. Um, and the ground was really set for it by a, a move toward deregulation in the, in the 1970s. The most, I is clearest in, in the fields of transport and telecommunications where um, uh, these were tightly regulated sectors in the 1970s and they went through major changes um, uh, in the 70s and 80s that, that made them much more flexible and created a much um, more fluid market, if you will. Um, deregulation of the airline industry, so freer competition in airlines. Deregulation of telephone companies, um, so that you had uh, an ability for, for new people to start firms and, and to enter the market and introduce new ways of doing things. 
and greater competition, leading to better, more efficiency, um, and just all around. A, a, you know, by, by promoting competition, what we ended up with was a was a much more flexible market and a market that was much more responsive to to the changes that globalization brought. I want to talk a little bit about innovation. Um, I guess one of the real sort of unique aspects of the U.S. economy um, compared both to developed countries in Europe and, and perhaps even more so to Japan is that in the United States there's a, there's a system that allows you to fail and try again. Um, It's linked, I think, to the American concept of a frontier spirit. In the, in the history of the United States, as the United States expanded westward, um, there was a, a long period of history, um, basically from you know, the, the, the 17th century up until the beginning of the 20th century, where the country was continuing to expand to the west. And so if you immigrated to the United States, right there, you had a new chance to, to, to start something over again, to start a new activity, to reinvent yourself. And if you landed in New York or Philadelphia on the East Coast and things didn't go well, you could pick up and go out to Western territories where they might not have big cities, but they also had a lot of open space, both physically having open space, but also socially having open space to try new things, to reinvent yourself. Um, to, to take another shot at it. And I, I think it's fair to say that that history has helped give us a culture where if you want to start a company in the US um, and you have a good idea and you can convince investors that you know what you're doing or banks that you know what you're doing, under normal circumstances, it would be possible for you to get the money you need to start your business. And maybe your business will fail spectacularly. Maybe it'll just fall flat on its face. Um, but that doesn't mean the end of your career. If you can learn from that experience um, and come up with another good idea, it's still possible to convince banks and investors um, that maybe you've got something that's worth them putting their money into. And so you get another shot. Um, in a way that I don't think is, is possible, that people tell me isn't possible in Japan, though I wonder, but, but in Europe as well, that um, the social context in those places is, is tighter and, and less forgiving of failure. Um, so when you add up all these companies, all these entrepreneurs, all these people trying different things and some of them failing and some of them succeeding, um, ultimately what you get, if it works right, at least in theory, is that you get human resources and financial resources going to the activities, to the companies, to the firms that have the most potential. Um, and you have a process in which banks, investors, and not so much the government makes a decision on what projects get financed. Why is that important? Um, well, if you look at, uh, I'm just to, to build on this a little bit, if you look a little bit at how, you know, some of the traits of the United States and how it, it, it's developed, you, you know, the qualities of, you know, the way people think about Government in the U.S., they don't have a lot of trust in government. Um, they have much more trust in, in the private sector. Um, they have much more confidence in the markets to come up with the right answers to things. Um, and so they have this culture of fostering market-led innovation, and they have a, a unique ability to keep moving resources, capital, finance from things that don't work, out of things that don't work, and into things that do work. Um, if you look at, this is a very, very simplified characterization, so forgive me for that, but in a very broad brush kind of way, uh, the analysis of, of how Japan developed in the post-war period 
um, is that Japan being a much more consensus oriented society, much more respect for uh, governments, um, and that the challenge facing Japan to develop in the post-war period was one of trying to catch up with the United States and Europe. Trying to catch up with, you know, you, you have a very specific goal in front of you, you, you can think very clearly about the steps you need to, to catch up to that goal, and then think about how it would work best in your own context. And it was spectacularly successful. Japan did catch up. And Korea and Taiwan um, doing the same. And China doing the same. Um, the problem is if you don't have a culture of innovation that allows you to try new and untested directions and new and untested things, um, you'll reach that development goal, but once you've reached it, what do you do next? Where is the next target? It's, it's a little bit harder to come up with um, a clear and, and reliable decision on what way to take your economy next. Um, and the problem with having governments in a decision-making role is that governments don't like to admit that they've made a mistake. That's true of my government as much as anyone else's government. And if they do make a mistake, it becomes hard to undo it. And if they don't undo mistakes that they've made, then economies will tend to become more rigid. Um, they'll be less able to adjust to changes in a world that is changing faster and faster all the time. I hope you can see this. Um, I talked about the U.S. as being an engine of growth, um, and I think a lot of people would, would perhaps agree with that if you're talking about the United States up until about 2008. Um, but in 2008, we had a financial crisis. Um, it's not the first one we've had, and it's not the last one that we'll have, but it was a big one. Um, Look at some previous examples. In, uh, in 1929, we had a stark market crash. It was, we had a bubble. We had speculation that went out, out of hand. Um, uh, people built up values of, of stocks and, and uh, to points that, that had nothing to do with what they were really worth. And then the conf confidence was lost. Something you know, led to a loss of confidence, and the whole market collapsed. Um, on a much smaller scale, we had the same thing in our information technology markets in the United States in 1999-2000. Um, all of a sudden, people started to bid up the prices of, of stocks in companies that were in the IT sector to, to levels that were just completely unconnected with um, you know, what those companies were actually worth. And eventually, that bubble burst, and our stock market crashed, and we had a, we had a recession. Um, the 2008 crisis was, was a bit different because it was about real estate, about property. Um, and you had very innovative investment banks coming up with bright ideas about how to finance loans and let people buy property who didn't really have uh, the income to be able to afford property. Um, And then eventually you get into a cycle where people say, gee, there is so much money to be made in property, I need to buy property. And if everybody buys property, oh, the whole market goes up. And eventually people realize that they're losing touch with reality. And pretty soon the bubble bursts and, and the market collapses. Only this time, because of the way that our investment